Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to Romans 15, 30 through 33. This will be the conclusion of this particular chapter, and we only have one more chapter to go. And we're talking today about the, the anatomy of prayer. The text today is a call to prayer, and I think if ever there was a time and a season that we needed to be called to prayer, I believe this is the day. It reminds me what the writer of Chronicles tells us, and especially in the hour in which we're living. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, God said, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and heal their land. I think if ever there's a time, we've got an election coming up Tuesday this week, uh, I just am praying that we don't have the issues that they think we may have in our in our cities and in our streets. I just pray that people will calm down and uh, and act civilized and uh, and that uh, God will move on hearts and lives and our nation will be reunited. And uh, and I pray that uh, God will move, but you know the key to what God wants to do in our church, in our homes, our families, our lives and in our nation and in the world today, a very key factor of that is our prayer life. So Paul wants the church at Rome to pray for the plans that he had for them, that the plans that God had laid upon his heart to, to be utilized would be successful and that great good would come to the people and great blessings would come to the Lord. So Paul is going to show us that we need to pray. And I'm here today to undergird that and to tell you and to echo and ditto that, that we are needing to pray along with being encouragers uh, while we pray for others. We should pray, and in that prayer time, we should be encouraging people through our prayers. So then the question is posed at us, and we ask the question, so what is prayer? I know there are a gazillion types of uh, definitions out there. You can go online and see every definition from A to Z and beyond. But, you know, prayer is too often associated with a ritual that makes us feel better rather than so much seeking the face of our glorious God and getting the results. You know, prayer gets results. You know, that's God's desire is prayer gets results. We don't just pray to make ourselves say, oh, good little me, I prayed and everything's going to be all right. That's not what your prayer life is about. It's not to soothe you or ease you or whatever you're using prayer for. It's not a ritual. It's very important that we do that. So, and not picking on any denominations, but Catholic, they pray the rosary. They're speaking, uh, basically repeating uh, memorized prayers with each bead on the rosary. Well, you know, God says, get away from these repetitious, vain repetitious prayers. So not only that, but Muslims have, have a similar type of bead by which they mindlessly utter memorized phrases to Allah. There's only one God. And we pray to God through Jesus the Son. Amen. So in the midst of situations, prayer is compared to people, I hear people say, oh, you really got lucky, didn't you, huh? You know, I prayed for you and you really, you really got through because you got, no, you didn't get lucky. Let me just tell you right now, there is no such thing as luck. But I'll tell you what, there is something that today that will work and it's called prayer. And prayer is not rolling the dice or gambling or prayer is not getting lucky. Prayer is not saying cross your fingers or whatever you're doing. It doesn't have anything to do with that. A definition of prayer is simply this. And I'm going to give it to you in a, in a capsulization of prayer today. In definition is prayer is a declaration of our dependence upon God. Prayer is our declaration of our dependence upon God. Prayer is our declaration of our dependence upon God. And so therefore when you're praying, you're saying, God, I'm depending on you. You know, if we learn to pray maybe first instead of going out here and wreaking havoc and causing problems and really crashing and falling flat on our face, and then we turn and we say, well, there's always prayer. Maybe if we learn to pray first, maybe things would then work more cohesively for us in our lives. We're forgiven through prayer. Did you know that? You went into a relationship with God. What? Through prayer. Remember you cried out to God and you said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I've rejected you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart my life and save me. And on that moment, that second, when you called out for the God, God saved your soul. Hallelujah. We thank him through prayer. It's something that we should be doing every day. In all things, we should be giving thanks, the word of God tells us. We petition him through our prayers. We today bring our needs, our burdens, our situations and everything. You know what? We should pray about everything and worry about nothing. But how many of us are doing that? 
We worry first and then we pray later, don't we? Well, you need to reverse the table on that. If you want to stop worrying so much, why don't you start praying more? Amen, Pastor. Thank you. We glorify him through prayer. You cannot give God enough glory. Your prayer life is just not coming to bring God your shopping list of what you won't need in life. Your prayer list is first and foremost to glorify God. You should start with glorifying God. You should mingle in your prayers glorifying God. And you should conclude your prayers with glorifying God. Amen. So prayer is the open admission today that without God, we can do nothing. And that is so true. Without God, you can do nothing. But remember also what Paul said in Philippians 4.13. I can then do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Are you hearing me? So if anything's going to happen in your life, you've got to pray. Any strength that you've got has got to come through God in the prayer life that you've got. If you're going to see things happen in your life, if we would learn to pray more, trust God more, rely on Him more, maybe we'd see more happen in our lives to the glory of God. Amen. Now there are two spiritual activities that should never cease in a believer's life. And number one is reading God's word. You are to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, right? We are to read God's word. You need to dive into God's word. You need to be reading God's word every day. You need today to practice picking up the Bible, however you read it, whether you do it on your cell phone or in the, the book or however you've got it, you need to read God's word every day. I am very proud of that church for the last two years we've given people the opportunity each month we pass out a sheet by the way your november prayer sheet or your number your november bible reading sheet is right there next to brian at the soundboard and you can grab it as you go well pastor come on i've already missed 10 months it's too late to start now never too late to start reading god's word and I would encourage you to read through God's Word. Well, what we've done for 12 or what we've done for 10 months and will be 12 months, reading through the pages of God's Word every day. In this study that you had this year, you will have read through the Bible, you'll read through the Psalms, and you'll have read through the Proverbs two times. You know, well, if you missed it, don't stop. Get involved and pick up a sheet and start now. And then next year, we're going to do it, but we're going to put a little bit different twist to it next year as we do each year. And we want you reading through God's Word. Is Bible reading then necessary in my life? You bet it is. It's just not what you hear me read to you each Sunday. It's what you are in the Word. If you're going to get the Word in you, you've got to get in the Word that your life can be changed. So the first thing that you've got to do today, you've got to be consistent and constant and faithful in reading God's Word. And the church said what? Amen. Secondly, today, you've got to be a person of prayer. It's not you depending on somebody else to pray you through. You know what? The same God that I can call on or anyone else of you can call on, we can all call on. But you've got to first come to him in the prayer of salvation and invite him into your heart and your life and be saved. And then, you know what? All of heaven then is opened up to you in the process of prayer. We today are lacking because we're not praying. We today can see our nation our homes, our families, our communities, our churches. We can see God moving in a mighty way, but it's going to take us as the people of God getting back to today the potential and the power that prayer will bring in your life. Amen. amen. Now turn your attention today. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. You're in Facebook. You might as well say amen too. Thank you. I appreciate that. I trust they said it. Let's turn our attention now to the pages of God's Word and see what God has to say. I'm in Romans 15, 30 through 33. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness, mm, that's a rich word, in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit. A couple things happening here. You better pay attention to it. For what? For the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the, of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in 
in Judea. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted, <coughs> excuse me, of the saints. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now, the God of peace be with you all. And he said, what? Amen. amen. You know what amen means? So be it. Let it be done. Amen. So one of the most natural things a Christian can say in their response to people is, and to another Christian is, and they ask this question, how can I pray for you? I know sometimes we say to people, I'm praying for you. Well, that's great and good, but isn't it really better to ask, to ask a person, how can I pray for you? Because if you just say, I'm praying for you, in all probability, you just kind of pray and like, bless them and Lord and let it go with that. I believe prayer should be specific. I believe prayer should be concentrated. I believe prayer should be centered. I believe we need to know what we're praying for. Amen? So people are reluctant today, though, to share personal prayer needs in their lives. And you know why? Because people violate people's trust. Somebody will say, well, you pray for me. Oh, yeah, well, I've got this going on in my life, or I'm facing this, or whatever the case may be. And then they ask you to pray for them. They didn't ask you to put it on Facebook and tell the world what was going on in their life. You know, you're not the bearer of the news, may I say. You're not the one to go tattling on everybody else and what's going on in their life. You're to pray for them. If they want everybody else to know, leave that up to them, right? So we ought to pray for people. So, one, today we really need to get ourselves more conditioned to ask people, how can I pray for you? And let me just throw this one in too. If you ask them that, make sure that you do it because if you do that and you don't pray, then you sin against that person. Also, you've got to understand that we are to lift up one another, to pray for one another. And actually, what is happening today in the rank of the church, because we are failing in our prayer life, because we're not praying one for another, because we're not getting specific and directed in our prayer life, then it's got a paralyzing plague on the church that the church is not effective today. I don't know where we have gotten this mentality that during this pandemic, during this coronavirus, during these times, in which we're in, that the church is supposed to sit down and be quiet and do nothing. I haven't read that in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Word of God tells us to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord, right? We ought to be consistent. We ought to be faithful. We ought to trust God and to do the work that God's called us to do. And so there, therefore, it's not a time that we sit idly by and do nothing. It's a time that we rise up, we stand up, and we start praying and we start doing something for the cause of Christ. So this is crucially important for us today that we are in a position of prayer and that we're praying one for another. So every one of us today that's in this building carries some type of burden in their life, don't they? Do you carry a burden in your life today? Have you got today a problem? Have you got a difficulty or whatever today? Let's just stop the service right here. I just got a note. Tom just text. And his dad is non-responsive. Father, we come before your throne today. You're the God of heaven. You're the God of earth. You're the God who can do all things. We lift up Gene today. And Lord, we know that you're the giver of life. You're the sustain of life. You're the God today that possesses the power to do all things. And we stand in the gap a prayer today, praying for Gene, praying for his family. Oh God, have mercy and grace. And Lord, we just have to say, Lord, we trust you in all things. We place our confidence, but I also pray today that those arms of yours that are strong and powerful and mighty, I just pray that you will take this family and take Gene and pull them ever closer to yourself and whisper into their spirit, peace be still, for you are with that family. And God, you can work a miracle and you can do something, Lord, that is beyond our comprehension. We just pray thy will be done. As we just heard Selah sing a few moments ago, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done. And may you, Lord, pour out your grace, your help in this great hour of need. 
We cry out to the God of heaven who can do beyond our imagination and ask for the touch of our God in Gene's benefit today. And Lord, regardless, we will still say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. May you be honored and may you be praised and may you be glorified and bless this family in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Continue to pray. It's a shame that it's a shame that we are carrying that fact of knowing that Christians have burdens and we don't share those burdens and pray for them. We today should be people who are burden bearers, interceders, prayer warriors. I don't know if you've got a prayer closet or not. It's not important. What is important is that you're a person who believes in the power of prayer. And that not only do you believe in the power of prayer, but you are a prayer warrior that you pray. You know, we find with Paul at the close of this chapter, we find Paul is asking the church to intercede, to pray for him. I find something about Paul that today we too should be dependent upon. Paul was dependent upon the prayers of godly people. Yes, we're dependent upon the Lord first and foremost as we pray and we call upon the Lord. But I also believe today that God has placed people in our path of life. And today he's united our hearts together in one accord and bond and fellowship and as a part of the body of Christ. And that process that we work in our lives is called that we pray together, we believe together, and we see God bless his people. Amen. We too must have that same dependence in prayer. We've got to depend upon the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. We've got to call upon the God today and don't pray with skepticism and doubt. Pray today with firm conviction that God can and God will. But also know today that his will will be done. Now a lot of times the will that maybe we have and the will that God has somewhat clash. But I want you to know today his will is the most important. His will is the will that today we need to trust in, rely upon, and put our confidence in today. Let us not forget the words of the great writer James where he said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Take that term and that meant the gender of all Christian people. The effectual fervent prayer today of a righteous person, a child of God, will avail much. Much is done through prayer. Don't expect God to do anything if you're not praying. Don't expect God to move if you're not calling on the Lord. Amen. Now listen. We need to be people of prayer, don't we? Say amen. amen. So here we go. Now the theme of the message is this. An effective prayer life happens on purpose. An effective prayer life happens. It's not by chance. It's not the snap of a finger. It's not crossing your fingers. It's not in a process of luck or any of those things today. The process of the effectual fervent prayer today happens today in purpose by God. Are you ready today? And I ask you this question. Are you in a position in your life, you should be, that you are ready as a Christian to really gear up today and become today someone that knows how to pray? I mean, today, it's very simple. One, you just got to make the step and say, yes, I'm, I am ready to gear up in my prayer life I am ready to trust God. I am ready to be an intercessor. I am ready to intercede. I am ready to call on the name of the Lord. I am ready to put my trust in God. I am ready to reach out. And even what I don't know and I don't see, I've got enough of God in me to trust that God will move and he'll be glorified and he'll bring good to his people. Amen. I got seven little quick points for you today. Number one, effective prayer starts with humility. Uh, well, that was kind of like a kick in the shins right there, wasn't it? Starts with humility. If you're not in the process of humility, you're not into prayer. I'm going to tell you point blank. Paul was telling the church, I need your help. And you know, you've got to come to the end of you and you've got to realize you need help. You've got to realize you need God's help. You've got to realize you need the help of other people today. God just didn't throw you in this by just to put you here. He put you here for a purpose. We need the people to get today on their knees. And this is what Paul needed. He needed the people to get on their knees and pray and call out to God on his behalf. So Paul wanted the people to pray in such a way that, that basically heaven will feel the request that is being offered up. 
And heaven hears our every plea, our every call. Every one of them. God knows every prayer. Listen, if all 9 billion people on planet earth prayed at one time, God could discern every prayer that was prayed. That's the power that he possesses. We are the children of God, but here on earth today, we are in absolute need. We came into this world. We started this life in need. We had no hope. We had no help. But thank God there was a God that says, call unto me and I will answer you. Here's a God that sent his son to die for us. We came into this world needful. We came into this world sinful. We came into this world without Christ. We came into this world barren and broken. But thanks be unto God that God today heard our cry of salvation. And God reached down and saved our soul. Amen. So today we all stand in need today. You can't solve your problems. You don't have all the answers. I don't care how intelligent you are or how much money you've got. You don't have all the solutions for life. But God does. Amen. Give him some praise. It starts with you and I saying, I need help. Amen. Effective prayer starts when we push our pride aside and we genuinely say, I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to pray for me. Amen. By simply an amen. How many of you need prayer? Shout it out. It starts with humility and saying, I've got a need today. Secondly, effective prayer is built on a process that is called trust. Are you someone today, another Christian could come to and say, I need you to pray for me. I mean, you know, folks, that's, that's an honor to be able to pray for people. We need to be people that other brothers and sisters can trust. Not to violate our trust, but to trust us that we would pray for you. Amen. You know what happens to a lot of people sometimes? I'm just going to tell you right just the way it is. Somebody will say, you know, i got this need going on in my life. i got this burden. i got this family issue. i got this. i got the other going on in my life. And uh, brother, sister, I need your prayers. Oh, brother, you know I will pray for you. Oh, yes, I'm going to intercede. I'm going to call on God for you. You can count on me. Click up. The phone hangs up. Hey, did you hear about oh so-and-so? Oh, we get on Facebook. I'm not mentioning no names, but did you, have you heard about, come on, folks. You're not, the, you're not the town herald. You're not the messenger to tell everybody what's happening in everybody else's life. Amen. Amen. Listen, God's given you and I today a church so that we don't have to walk through this life alone. We are going to be in the same heaven together, as Matt Redwin sang when we all get to heaven this morning. We're going to be in heaven together, but let me tell you what. We need each other. We're in church together. We need to lean on one another. We need to love one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to care for one another. Amen. Understand we're vessels of clay. We're weak. We're needy. And we need others today. Well, all I need is the Lord. But you think of day about this. Why did God then put brothers and sisters around you? That they could help you and to bear your burdens today. When you put your faith in Jesus and salvation, you are part of the body of Christ today. You are now a member today of the greatest organization that can ever be found on earth. And it's called the church, the living church of the living God. Amen. And we share one another and we carry one another's burdens. We are to be people who are trustworthy. And when somebody says to pray, you pray for them. I found one of the greatest times of prayer is when they ask you, do it right there. Amen. Can someone today come to you and ask you to pray for them? And will you do that? Will you today be faithful? Will you be trustworthy? Will you be accountable that you can be a person of prayer? Thirdly, effective prayer stands on rock solid theology. To be theological means today you're studying the things of God. You're studying the word of God. So in church, we need to be growing deeper in our theology, don't we? And we grasp the fact today, that, and to, and to really grasp this thing of theology, it means today that we're filled with the spirit of God. That, that's, that's Bible stuff. Did you know that? 
I mean, James said, listen, you ought to be filled today with the Spirit of God. That's how you can resist the devil when he flees from you. You know why so many of us are nothing but devil bait? Because today we're not doing this. We're not submitting ourselves to God. We're not today taking up the word of God. We're not digesting the word of God into our spirit. We're not living for God. We go through motions and we make people think and we dress good, smell good and everything else. Walk straight and smile a lot. And we make everybody think, whoo, man, they everything that ever God could ever want in a person. But you know what? When you peel off the cover, you find that it's shallow. It's empty. There's nothing there. God wants you to be filled with his spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit, it means today you've got to crown Him Lord of your life. It means you've got to put Him first in your life today. You've got to today seek the Lord, be filled with God's Spirit. That sets the devil today on alert because here comes a Spirit-filled Holy Ghost believer that believes in God and prays and trusts God and reads the Word. And let me tell you what, now you are armed and dangerous against the devil. Amen. Praise God. Paul asked them to pray for him. He asked them to pray for him by the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason he said is to remind us that the only way for us today to go to God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's your access. He's your door. He's the means. He's the way, the truth, the life. He's the one today you pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, if he was good enough to come down and to die for you on the cross, don't you think he's good enough to pray through him? Amen. I'm going to tell you, God's not going to hear your prayer if you don't. Bottom line. Jesus was willing to go to the cross for sinners like you and I. He was willing to bear the wrath for all humanity today that was poured out upon himself. He paid for our sins today. You know what? That, this is not just the only good news that we've got. But also today, you know what Jesus does? He just doesn't save you. But now he's giving you his righteousness. And that righteousness is placed in you today. Therefore, today, when you pray, you're able today to go to God. And listen, it's through the sin bearer. It's through the one that has forgiven you. It's through the Savior. It's through this one that is called Jesus, the Lord. He's the one that we go to God in and pray through. And we see the results of that he produces and provides. Paul wrote to Timothy and he said this. There is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. The way to go to the throne was through this way that has been open to you and I through Jesus Christ that we can come today as Paul or as the writer of Hebrews tells us we can come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need Hebrews 4:16 So our prayers are to God through Jesus Amen Isn't that exciting? You can talk to God through Jesus. And Jesus is on the throne, sitting there at the right hand of the Father and said, Yeah, Father, that's one of ours. Woo! Let's bless them good. Amen. Praise God. Not only that, then you've got the Spirit of God in you that empowers you to pray. And He will. We pray to God the Father. On the merits of Jesus, the Son, and we're empowered by God on the merits of the Spirit of God that lives within us today. Effective prayer stands on deep theology. The deeper your theology today, the deeper your prayer life. See, if you're just not, if you're just flirting around with the Bible and God, you don't have a very deep prayer life because you don't have a very deep theology. And today, theology is not what a school gives you. Theology is you getting in God's word and applying it to your life. Simply stated. Our prayer should be built on solid rock theology. Fourthly, the last several are quick. Effective prayer involves hard work. Did I lose anybody on that one? When you see see Jesus in Gethsemane's garden, we see him what? I mean, how do we see him? We see him... In agony, don't we? Doesn't the scripture say that as he prayed, his sweat became his great drops of blood? And and realizing this, he agonized in prayer. Paul also explained to Timothy that he had to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to pray and pray through. 
You know, one of the evidences today of a child of God, one of the weapons of our warfare today, as Paul mentioned in Ephesians 6, is today the lance of prayer. We put on the helmet of salvation and all those things that are recorded there. But you need today that prayer power in your life. So there's agony in prayer. Jesus had agony in prayer. Think about Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God. And you know what Jacob said? I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Amen. That's agony in prayer. Even put his hip out of joint. Then there was Moses who led the children of Israel. And there Moses on his face is pleading to God to spare these rebellious Israelites. And thank God God did. See, God does hear the effectual fervent prayer. And then there's the agony in prayer today. You realize this, that prayer is not making a deal with God. It's prayer that's deep, it's spiritual, it's intense today. And so like Elijah, when he prayed for rain, you know what? It didn't rain. He prayed, it didn't rain just immediately. What happened? He had to keep on praying, didn't he? (laughs) Did it rain? Come on. Did it rain? Say amen. I'm telling you, you just can't pray one flipping prayer and say, okay, it's in God's hands now. No, you got to keep praying, man. Praying through, trusting God, keep calling on the Lord. When was the last time you were worn out from praying? Worn out from praying. We get worn out from working. We come dragging in, fall in the seat. Oh, I hope something's good for supper tonight. We are, I'm so tired. When was the last time you were so tired from praying? Beat up and worn down and wore out from praying. Number five. Whoo, preacher, you loaded with questions today. If to be effective prayer seeks tangible results. This is praying for something to happen, right? So there are some things that you need to be praying for. You know, nothing wrong with praying for protection. God will protect you today. Paul had been faced with obstacles, all the things that he'd been through. You know what? He needed protective prayer. Did God give it? He sure did. He prayed for tangible, measurable, real results. You know what? Prayer brings real results, doesn't it? It brings things to fruition. It makes things happen. Not only that, but there was prayers from the standpoint of congregation. Praying that the gospel would be clear, the unity is real, and the people are humble. You know, Paul said, we pray and we look for something to happen. And you listen, if you're not praying and believing something's going to happen, well, why are you praying? Just to soothe your conscience? That's not going to work. Man, pray with expectation. Pray believing. Pray trusting. Reach, I mean, get a hold of the horns of the altar and pray through until God answers, amen. You know what P-R-A-Y stands for? Pray until something happens. We need to pray until something happens. Amen. Then sixthly, effective prayer submits to God's will. Remember the prayer of Jesus to the Father. What did Jesus say on the cross? Thy will be done, didn't he? Didn't he cry out to God in his prayers and, or in the Garden of Gethsemane and pray that thy will be done? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Do you have resentment towards God because God hasn't answered your prayer the way that you wanted him to? Or he hasn't done something the way that you wanted him to? Or you kind of got to chip on your shoulder because God hasn't done something in timing that you want it done and you just kind of got resentful. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to church. I've just, I'm just, had it. Had it. I've had it. No. That's not the way you approach God. You've got to approach God today knowing that God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. You've got to approach God today that he's omnipotent, that he's all-powerful. God can do all things exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us, right? So therefore today, if you've got resentment towards God, you better get that on the altar and get it out of your system today and start loving God, trusting God, and living for God. Amen. God works out all things on his timetable for your good. Have you read Romans 8, 28? And so therefore, are you willing today to submit your request to the God of heaven joyfully that God's will be done? And you've got to trust him for that. I know there are things that we want to happen. I know there are things that we're praying for. 
And I'm telling you today, in God's timing, God's will will be done. There's a lot of things that's happened in my life, to my family, to you, to each of us, that I can't give you a justified explanation about why. But you know what? I didn't go around with a chip on my shoulder or an attitude. I said, to God be the glory. I'm going to trust Him and put my confidence in Him because God knows what's best. Amen. And seventhly, effective prayer rejoices when other people flourish. Paul's prayer was that the people would flourish even as his life was unraveling. Paul is such a great example, humanly speaking, for you and I. To know what he was going through and faced and had been shipwrecked and beaten. And I mean, all the things he faced, but you know what? He never lost his faith, his reliance, his resilience in God. And folks, today, Paul's prayer was that the people would flourish even when his seemingly life was unraveling before him. You know what that is? I'll tell you that in a statement with an explanation point at the end. That is what I call real praying. Amen. Are you willing to become effective in your prayer life today? Are you willing to turn it all over to God? Are you willing today to give it all to him today? This will happen when you what? I'll rehearse this with you one more time. When you humble yourself before God, when you are then trustworthy, when you have grown in your theology, in your grace, in your knowledge of God, and when you're willing to even suffer for the cause of Christ, and when you ask God specifically, get away from generality prayers and ask God specifically, believing specifically, that God will answer specifically, amen. And when you then submit, and here it is on the bottom line, when you submit your will to the will of God. If it was important for Jesus to pray, not my will, he was God incarnate in flesh. Not my will, but thy will be done how much more important it is for you and I to say, Lord, I just don't understand it all. I don't understand the how. I don't understand the what. But I do one thing I do understand. I understand the who is greater than whatever I'm in. That he, you God, will bring me through whatever I'm facing. How effective is your prayer life? And as we offer an invitation now, I draw your attention to the fact you can come. 45 feet across these altars for you to come and pray. What good is it if you don't use it? What good is prayer if you don't exercise it? You've got to be people of prayer. We've got to be a praying church. And man, we've seen God answer prayer this year. And it's not about to stop here. There's greater things that God wants to do. Let me ask you, what needs to change in your life today? Are there things that needs to change? In order for your prayer life to be enriched? What sins do you have lingering in your heart, in your soul, in your life, in your mind today that needs to be forgiven? Aren't you glad that he says if you, if you will call upon him, he will forgive you if you today will come repentant? What problems are you facing? We all have them, don't we? Anybody in here problematically free? Of nothing? You ain't got nothing wrong going on in your life? That's what I thought. What burdens on your heart today? And I think I could say every one of us have a burden on our heart in some capacity, if not multiple burdens. What burdens? You just don't let them linger and sit there? You know what God said? Pray about it. You know what Peter said about your burdens? Cast them on the Lord because he cares for you. And lastly, what praise do you need to give to God? Are you praising the Lord? I am when I get out of what I'm in. No, you better praise him now while you're in it. Because listen. That will get God's attention when you can praise him. Look at Job, 42 chapters of hell on earth. And what did he do? He said, listen, man, I know that my God is able. That same God is here for you and I today. So whatever you're in today, you've got to learn to praise God and give him the glory. I ask you today, will you move forward in your prayer life, your spiritual life? Will you come praying today? There are a multitude of prayer needs today. Father, we stand to our feet.